Uh, I will call to order the meeting of the City Council Committee on City Services and uh, note that present at this meeting are the members of the City Council. Uh, there is Councillor Dennis Bigwell from Ward 2, Councillor at Large Ryan O'Donnell, Councillor Marianne Labarge from Ward 6, and myself, Councillor Melanie Carney from Ward 1. Uh, and I'll first ask, which is our regular practice, if there is any public comment tonight. And I'm here to listen. Very good. We know, just noted that there are a few members in the, con in the public here. And I will introduce our... Uh, yes. Will there be opportunity for uh, comment later from the public, or is this the only opportunity? No, I think we can offer opportunity okay. during this. We're rather informal right. at this uh, at this meeting. And um, before we take on the other items of business, what we'll do is actually open it up. We are still waiting for the police, but we have a presentation <clears throat> uh, tonight. And it really comes from a lot of uh, discussion in this committee. While our overall uh, responsibilities are to deal with many city departments and with appointments as they come up for city boards, we thought that we might look across city departments, uh, especially with regard to important issues that face the city. And this one was looking at the opioid ep epidemic. Uh, at one point last year, we had a similar uh, meeting where we pulled together multi-departments and tonight we were able to pull together the police, the Department of Health, um, the city, uh, I'm sorry, the attorney, uh, district attorney's office, and the police, and the police weren't here yet. But um, overall we know that as uh, Councillor O'Donnell sent out in a press release to folks prior to this meeting, that there were a number of confirmed unintentional opioid overdose deaths in Northampton over the last number of years. In 2012, there was one, and th three in 2013, 11 in 2014, four in 2015, and, and in 2016, there were six deaths reported of the 44 overdoses that were called in to city departments. So given that, and then the most recent news that we saw in the Gazette over the last weekend of um, six, uh, yeah, six stories of uh, overdoses <coughs> within 24 hours, and you know the departments, the city departments that responded to those, and the DA's office and Saturday. Yeah, so um, that came about as a coincidence, but we are really happy to hear from all the departments regarding this is something that's of primary importance to citizens in Northampton. And I guess what we'll do is um, we'll open it up, start with, uh, I thought we'd start with fire and rescue and police who aren't here and then turn it over to the Board of Health and to the DA's office, if that works out. And during throughout, if there are comments or questions from the public and other counselors, please just chime in. Yeah, so uh, basically we, we have had a rash. Uh, <coughs> it was started Friday. Yep. Uh, started Friday uh, into Saturday that we did. It was six, John? Yes. Those, is that what you responded Well, we, we, uh, one they didn't get because he ran down the road. But, yeah. So, so it, it's one of those things of... Uh, he ran down the road? It, it, once we administered uh, Narcan, uh, the individual got up and left the scene. So we, we never actually seen him uh, from EMS. Uh, he had fled from there. So we had six on our side of it. PD probably has more because of cases like that where once we administer Narcan, what it does is it brings them out of, the, out of their, uh, their high and, uh, and they do at times walk away or they walk away and we don't have the opportunity to really see them and treat them from that. Uh, so. Uh, Deputy Therapy put together uh, kind of a packet for you, uh, kind of what we have for SATs uh, from Fire Rescue over the last few years. And I'll turn it over to John if he wants to work, walk through the graph with you. 
So uh, based on um, uh, some information, I went back and researched it back to 2009. And if you notice, the, the blues are basic number of calls where Narcan was administered. So I'm able to track through our computer. Now this only also deals with people that we deal with on the, the fire side as far as have we administered it or a first responder that we would then take care of from have administered. I'm sure PD has used more doses than that, but these are numbers on the ambulance. Uh, so from 2009 up to 2016, um, so I have a number of calls where Narcan was administered. Uh, the next group, I guess it's the orange or rust color one, that's the number of calls that we were actually dispatched to as an overdose. And then you know, the neat one, and not neat one, but the, the green section you're seeing here is, uh, these are actually the overdoses that we transported to the hospital. These are calls that we, maybe you got a call for a seizure or just a simple man down, and then we, we get there and we find out they're actually an overdose. Now, the other thing is not all overdoses get Narcan because Narcan only works on opioids. We see a lot of other over overdoses out there between uh, barbiturates, uh, actually, uh, it's probably a good one, your cocaine, your bath salts. There's such a list out there of different drugs that, and then even alcohol is, you know, is, uh, there's so many different overdoses that we go in. I mean, a person that's so drunk that they're actually to the point where they're almost dying is considered as, a, as an alcohol overdose, you know, at that point. So if you look at the green, you're gonna see that, you know, some of these calls, you know, over 100 calls a year that we're transporting people to the hospital with some form of a, an overdose. So I just kind of put that together for you. You can kind of see how the, that chart lays out. Uh, I also went ahead on the second page in, is I just went out to the Department of Public Health, and you have this information already. I can tell what you're talking about. This is the state statistics from the Department of Public Health on the overdoses in the area. And we also have some demographics in here as well as, you know, who's doing that. If you go to page three of that, the interesting thing is, um, and it's this chart right here, when I was reading this, um, everything, everybody talks about heroin overdoses, and I was just reading an article online, and the first question online was, when's the last time you went to a heroin overdose? Because chances are it wasn't a heroin overdose. We're seeing, and the district attorney probably back me up on fentanyl is now the drug of choice out there. So the majority of it, we're seeing it's fentanyl overdoses. And there's fentanyl, there's carfentanyl, and there's a new one that's even worse than that that's coming out of China. So, uh, and the new one that's coming out of China, Narcan doesn't work on, unfortunately, we're, we're hearing. So, um, we're, we're constantly evolving. We're, you know, we're more of a, a reactive group as far as the emergency medicine. Once we know that there's an emergency in, in place, we go out there, we react to saving their lives, um, where the PD is doing a great job of understanding, being more proactive in, in getting into what. Um, but if you listen to this, this chart here, if you look at the fentanyl, fentanyl has been a steady uh, uh, increase where actually uh, heroin is kind of coming down a little bit. So we're seeing that kind of change off where they used to cuff their, uh, uh, more, their, their heroin with fentanyl, now it's pretty much pure fentanyl we're getting. We're seeing it coming into the door and it's taking much more of a Narcan to reverse that effect because it's so much stronger. You know, fentanyl is <coughs> 40 times stronger than morphine. Uh, we're seeing that we're taking more and more of the Narcan. So we're seeing more of an increase in our usage and our costs, of course, because is of that. Is that done by pill or? It's actually, it's more, it's in a powder form, just like the heroin would be, they just cut it. They're just cutting it with that. Um, um, they can, they can, there's multiple ways to get this in your system, you, you know, where you, you know, most of it is injection. You know, you can ingest it, you can inject it, you can inhale it, there's, and then the new, um, and I don't have a lot of information on it, it's very new, I just read an article on it, the, the new, uh, I can't remember the name of the fentanyl that's coming out of China. A grain of salt, size of it, on the table. You put your hand on it, it absorbs through your quick, hand so quickly, it'll knock one of us out. So I have to actually start training my crews to make sure they're always wearing gloves on calls because we don't haven't gotten into that yet, but we're going to. And I don't want to see one of our people end up going down and stop breathing instantly. Stop breathing because they got this in their system through absorption of their skin. So it's, it's scary stuff and it's dangerous for our people. Yeah, one of the challenges is the, the potency of it and one of the things that we're certainly having discussions on basically is to protect the first responders going in and taking precautions for that. But across the United States, we're hearing stories of uh, you know, first responders, whether it's police, fire, EMS going into these calls and whether they kick up some dust or, as John said, get some on their skin, they're having reactions to that. I never heard of it. So yeah, it's it's out there, it's just the potency is, is really high and yeah. there have been cases of first responders actually having problems and needing to be transported from the scene itself. Yeah. Um, so that's one of our concerns as we go forward, uh, worried about that. And as John said, our organization, we really respond kind of, we're, we're reactive. Uh, 
uh, basically to get on scene and do life-saving treatments uh, to keep you know the individual alive and, and give them the best care we can. Narcan is certainly one, uh, but the big thing is, is with opiates, the uh, respiratory system kind of shuts down. Would be basically we need to reform uh, and get them basically back back into breathing. And uh, in most cases, we're seeing the Narcan's taking more doses uh, to get people around uh, from what we did probably five years ago. Uh, so uh, it's, it's we're seeing a stronger drug out there. And where does it come from? from? Uh, I'll let the DA. The fentanyl is primarily from China. Uh, that's being added to heroin or, or taken straight or, you know, up through Mexico. So it's become the standard course. I know the last time that they did testing of heroin and those supposed, it was about 70 to 80 percent had some amount of fentanyl in it. So that's on that graph where you see fentanyl. Uh, that's an old graph probably just within the last year. It's probably gone up here. Yeah, we, these are exactly, these start with 2016. Um, the new stuff that we went in a few months in, we're at six month mark this year yet, but um, yeah, so this is what public health had. And it was actually, if you go into the pack, and I'm not actually doing that, but you look, look at the demographics, it's very interesting to see men versus women. And, and then the one thing you, you actually see when you go in there, it doesn't discriminate based on you know your social status either, though. It's, it's, across, it's across the board, everybody. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter who you are, what you know, it affects all social groups the same, you know. It's it's you know it's shocking stuff. It's it's you know unfortunately. What's the age so, bracket? Uh, I have actually here. I think it was the 30, 30 I you see twenty four to forty four is kind of the prime group. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. The other interesting thing though is um, on page this page here the map of the uh, this came out of the uh, public health. It shows uh, Ham Hampshire County. We're actually one of the lower brackets for as far as deaths per capita. Uh, we're doing pretty good compared to say like the Cape and Islands and all that. So I think if you have all this in front of you, you can go through your leisure. But um, it's just when I was researching this out because we had this meeting coming up. But uh, our numbers, as far as our, we've been kind of staying pretty consistent. I mean, we're seeing a spike here and there. And, and this year, I don't have unfortunately uh, good data. So the PD would have that for you to tell them exactly where we're at now because they're they they track it much more frequently than that we do. You know, we we report to the state and the state gives us back our information. So. Because the way we track, we, we don't track uh, opiate overdoses. We just do overdoses as a total of how many yeah. what they are as, uh, as jobs. <coughs> so in our data that we pull out, it could be an opiate overdose. It could be cocaine. It could be alcohol. And that's kind of how we track it. And a lot comes on how we're dispatched. Uh, we're not always dispatched for a overdose. It, it could come in as, as chest pains, cardiac arrest, difficulty breathing. And then our people have to make the determination of what, what are they dealing with once they're on scene and develop that treatment plan for them. So you may not, if I can ask, you may not track this, but it's probably known by someone uh, around this table. I mean, what, how would you quantify or characterize um, the amount of drugs that is, uh, comes from prescriptions? You know, they're not coming from Mexico or China, they're coming from the medicine cabinet somewhere. How does that factor? Those figures have really gone down. Um, it just people uh, have shifted over from oxycontin and vicodin to uh, to heroin so or i guess not a fentanyl so uh, there's a lot less of that i i know i've seen a couple in the last few months but really it, it's not that common you know it really is it's just the price of the of the product i mean an oxy, an oxy could be thirty dollars a pill versus you know heroin or fentanyl five dollars a bag so that's what's kind of driving it and Unfortunately, um, I, and when I say this, the stat for Hampshire is one of the lower in the states. That's only because we have so much outreach with Narcan and everything else. I mean, if you didn't have that, that really good first responders, I'm sure that the, it could be double the rate. Seriously, I mean, there's, there's that many recoveries from Narcan where if they didn't respond, it would be a death. Let me ask: Is the product like out on the street? Is that are they saying that here and? Uh, yeah, it, it, it all uh, comes uh, basically on the East Coast from New York to Hartford <coughs> or New York to Springfield or New York to Holyoke and, and then that product, uh, it's already been cut, so what you're getting, what Holyoke's getting is really what Northampton and, and other communities are getting, so, um, and, you know, fentanyl's 20 to 50 times stronger than heroin, so you really don't need that much added to, to really have that that cascade effect that puts people uh, over the edge and really you know, just stops their respiratory system all the time. So 
when you look at this map, it, as the district attorney points out, we're a lighter shade because of our response. And Narcan is saving lives, this kind of thing. But if, if you just looked at the number of overdoses, for example, in six over the weekend, none were fatalities. But if you looked at the number of overdoses, are those going up across the board? Would you would you say it's very safe in every part of the state? Yeah. Unfortunately, it, it is. Yeah, per, uh, we've kind of tried it over time that for every you know an Arcan resuscitation, and that's both community resuscitation because we get those statistics from Tapestry, but also from EMS fire. Um, you, you're probably talking ten overdose recoveries for every uh, death. So yeah, you know, you you know if there was 47 um, you know deaths in in the district, so to speak, in Hampshire, Franklin, there would probably be six, seven hundred, you know, yeah. Narcan recoveries. Because not everything gets reported. Because, again, we've been very aggressive on making sure people can walk into Walgreens, walk into CVS, uh, go through Tapestry to, to get their supply of Narcan. So we don't hear about all of them, but at least from what we can tell, the this, this, the rate the rate of overdoses is not going down. <coughs> so, Dave. <coughs> In other words, say there are Excuse deaths, me. is that because a call hasn't been made into either the police department or fire department, or they just find them? They just find them. I mean, it's the solitary user that, you know, they find them in the bathroom or in their bedroom. Or, you know, just uh, nobody was there to, to make the 911 call. And uh, Northampton police have been very good about you know, really talking very strongly about the Good Samaritan rule, that no one's going to get arrested for calling in an overdose. So that's really important that at least these calls are being made to 911 so they can go out and they can respond. Um, but it's really the, the solitary user uh, that just doesn't get any help. You know, they, they turn blue, they you know, stop breathing, and there's just nobody there to help them. <coughs> I was going to add to his, uh, what he's talking about the public. We see a lot, a lot now. We see where the public has administered Narcan prior to our arrival. Uh, that's actually getting the most common, you know, where we see that. Uh, we're getting a call for the Orioles, which is great because they, you know, just giving them Narcan, maybe fix them, that's a short-term gap. You need to be able to, to re-administer that because it wears off quicker than the, the fentanyl or heroin or the opioid that's in their system. So they, well, uh, the newest thing they did with the, the PC law has been fantastic because we can make them go to the hospital and be observed before they go back into a, another, you know, overdose again on the same drug that's in their system. So. We're seeing more of the, uh, the the public actually using the Narcan and, and giving that ahead of time as well, which is a is a great help, you know. So. And I think uh, you know Northampton's been very um, forward thinking because you know the DART program that that the Northampton police have that you know a day or two after uh, an overdose that you know, the police will give information to family members or to the individual you know on how to get treatment because really. Um, it's really a game of roulette right now. If you keep using, eventually it's going to catch up with you. So it's really making the good referrals for, for treatment. And hopefully more people will get into treatment and kind of you know, in kind of that cycle. I had a, a, a question. Yes. Within the 25 to 45, so mostly, I'm sorry, any particular trends with uh, veterans, homeless, youth? Um, what, 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 what trends are you seeing there? I, I would say it's across the board. I, I, don't, I don't think we can put a certain demographic to, to those overdoses. Uh, it, it's kind of really widespread uh, that we see. It's kind of everybody. Can I say something? Um, there isn't demographically uh, or socioeconomically, but there is by occupation. And um, builders, construction workers were uh, way, way uh, more affected um, in the 2014-2015 fatalities, it's much higher than anyone else. And the next was food service people, um, nurses, personal care attendants, and then people who are unemployed. Could I just ask you to introduce yourself, so for the record? Sure. Uh, my name is Lynn Farrow. I work with DA Sullivan. I coordinate the opioid task force within the DA's office. Thank you. So, I think when you hear those professions, particularly construction, uh, the, the the labor jobs, uh, they're more prone to injury and more prone to getting 
uh, opioids. So I think, you know, maybe if you dig a little bit deeper, it's those professionals that get injured on the job and would be more likely to get um, opioids prescribed or misprescribed. So um, I think um, it's certainly something that, you know, for me, you know, you'd be part of labor, it's something to keep an eye on. Quick question on, on that point. I know about a year ago now, a little, a little bit more, the legislature passed a comprehensive bill um, addressing this problem. It had many different things in it. One of them was to limit um, prescriptions uh, for opioids for pain uh, to, I believe, seven days. And I wonder if anyone has any sense one year later whether that's been effective um, or if it's hard to tell. You know, what, what are, is that still, it sounds like it is, a gateway into uh, addiction? You take a lot of steps. Maybe Lynn, you can address, uh, uh, Lynn actually works with the state. Um, it's, we've uh, devised a new prescription drug monitoring uh, that now every prescriber of opioids is required to register and also to, to list the drugs that they've given. So uh, th there's been a significant change um, over the last few years. Um. So it does affect the number of prescriptions being given out, first of all. And it does limit the doses and the number of pills per prescription. And, and that shows, definitely, that, that that's coming down gradually, but it's coming down. <clears throat> so the thought is that that will impact um, that will make it so people do not become addicted. So it takes care of that end of the problem, but those that are already using heroin are not gonna be affected by that at all. So once you've crossed over, those things the state is doing in that regard are not gonna help. But they will prevent people from becoming addicted, hopefully in the first place. So that's at the front end. And those who are in the middle then are the trajectory is they're going to heroin faster because the pills aren't as accessible and they're very expensive. It's the unintended consequences mm -hmm. of regulation that you know, these folks that have done opioids for a year, two years, maybe 10, 20 years, that it dries up. In other words, it, it's, it's wrong to instantly cut somebody off if they have an addiction, but that's what happens. The, the physician that's covering it does, doesn't want the liability of that opioid, you know, of, so they get cut off, and it's not like everybody immediately goes to treatment. They start, you know, looking for alternatives, and unfortunately, at you know five dollars a bag, heroin is the alternative. Or, or they're getting uh, not so much um, cut off, but they can't do the doctor shopping. So while they may be getting still the prescription from their current practitioner, they're not going to be able to get the, the number of pills that they've moved up to because it's not getting high anymore. It's, it's needing the higher dose to even not be sick from withdrawal. So that's, that's what's going on there also. So it sounds like to me that you're looking at intensive care under a caseworker, um, a psychologist, there's a lot involved ideally, there. Ideally, ideally you'd have a multidisciplinary team, um, you know, working with, with everyone, because it takes, it takes everyone, and it takes finding housing and jobs for them once they're in recovery so that uh, they stay sober, you know, yeah. And I, thank you for making that, that point, and one thing I would love some information on is, if you look at the name of that, bill that I referenced that the, the governor championed. It's, it's an act relative to substance use, treatment, education, and prevention. So all four categories are important, but um, the prescription, there was a change in the law to limit prescriptions. Uh, the same year, I'm not sure if this was restored, but $2 million was cut from the budget mid-year for substance abuse, I think, recovery programs, if I'm not mistaken. So I guess my question is from the perspective of advocates and people who are working on this issue day in, day out, isn't there an imbalance between, um, you know, uh, isn't there an imbalance here and, and are we falling short 
as a state, sure. not in Hampshire County, not necessarily in Northampton or Western Mass, but isn't the state falling short in providing the resources we need for ongoing recovery, which sure. takes a long time? They, they've rebuilt. I mean, I think they've really built in, you know, uh, more treatment beds, uh, you know, more places for recovery, but they've got a, a long way to go. And, you know, certainly I think we're probably tops in the country, which tells you how, how bad it is in other parts of the country. I mean, Kentucky and New Hampshire, um, they just don't have any resources up there. They, they haven't uh, voted the money, but our legislators here in New Hampshire County are really strong on advocating for, for the services we get. Yeah, so we're fortunate. Yeah, we, we are, and, uh, and I think that the government has stepped up and, and recognized that as, as number one problem. But there's always a long way to go because of uh, the fact that here is a disease where people relapse. So it, it's not enough just to get somebody into detox and then maybe seven days of treatment bed, but it, it's a long-term investment. And so, you know, I, I, we're going to have this problem for a very, very, very long time. It was 25 years in the making of this. <coughs> there is um, $1 million in the new 2018 budget for two new recovery centers that will, um, we here in Northampton will apply for, for one of those slots because we just did start like about six months ago, the Northampton Recovery Center here. So um, I think we're in a good place to be a, a contender for that for that funding, and I really hope we get one of those two slots. So do I. Congressman? Yes. Um, as we know, we have many, many athletes in our city or wherever throughout our state. And because of their injury, some might not be severe, but otherwise there is pain and so forth. Would this also affect like athletes? I'm not sure. One of, I don't know if we were directing to, but one of the interventions, we, we did recognize that as our Hampshire Health Collaborative. And uh, one of the things that we do, or we've introduced this year, is every year for the youth, if you play a sport, but you have to go through a concussion training. Well, they've integrated um, an opioid training too for the athletes, the parents, and the athletic director. So that's all rolled out in one. So the, that's was one that the happening, Meredith? This is the first year. The sep this September was the first year that it's been incorporated into the. So academy. in your pamphlet, in your package, is a, a pamphlet uh, on the uh, on the videos, and it's required to have concussion training, and this was an add-on. And you know, I think that the. The schools were very cooperative, both Smith Vocational and Northampton High School, you know, made it part of their uh, their outreach. So, so again, you know, trying to start as early as possible to warn exactly. people that, you know, you don't need an opioid for pain sometimes, you know, you just need Motrin and, you know, that should be. That's why I was curious about that, because you take that, and every time you're playing football or whatever, you're going to get hurt. But the injuries are not going to be that severe sometimes. So do you go back to it again and say, well, this is solving my problem right now? And does it get bigger and bigger? <coughs> but I think the fact that uh, parents and uh, coaches and trainers are, are you know, uh, being educated. You know, we just haven't had that education in our society. And that includes our doctors. So it's not just working with doctors, but it's, it's working with the people. And I, I can't say enough about training parents. You know, the fact that parents uh, are you're the one that controls what goes to your children, you know, the medications and certainly the pain medications and try to gear people toward non-prescriptions and alternatives to, uh, you know, painkillers. Well, I want to thank Dave's department anyways because in even the city of Northampton because it's just so serious out there. And you see it right here in our own city on the streets. I've seen it walking out of a business, which I was told, and I saw it happening very quickly, you know, and it's anything to save somebody's life because it's getting very serious. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, I, I believe um, Meredith O'Leary has a presentation. Sure, because a lot of what we've already been talking about okay. is kind of very, very and we have a few slides here. I mean, it, it's no secret that this opioid epidemic is nationwide. It, you know, Massachusetts hasn't been, uh, has been, you know, just as much affected as any other community or, uh, or state. So um, on average a day here in the United States, 
91 people die from opioid-related overdose. In Massachusetts, I think the number now is five people are dying a day from opioid-related overdose. Um, if you want to go to the first slide, Pam. Right here is a great slide. It demonstrates how the overdose rates have changed across the state in the last 15 years. So going from 2000 to 2015, it demonstrates the increase in both the spread and the intensity. The next slide is a visual of changing rates of heroin as a primary substance used in the past 15 years. So what these two slides did is it shows you why Massachusetts has gotten involved. Because what we see on the trajectory is about 2011, the opioid rates have hit such a high that you know it's no longer up to the state that's being done. The governor said, you need to do something on a local level. So funding became available. Hampshire Hope was born between the city of Northampton and the DA's office. We applied for a grant collaboratively. We received $550,000 for five years to work on this epidemic. Do you want to go to the next slide, Pam? And here you can see that trajectory. We have the state of Massachusetts in blue. We have Hampshire County in orange, and then Franklin, uh, Franklin and Athol County in, excuse me, in the, in the blue, yeah, in the blue. So you can see right there, around 2012, it's peaked and that's when this money became available. The next slide will show you what's going on in Northampton. And again, we're seeing the, the uptick in 2013-14, and these are fatalities going through through 2017. We have um, data for 2017 that was provided by the DA's office. There's only been in this first quarter three overdose, death, overdose deaths in uh, Hampshire County so far. So that just kind of gives you a snapshot on what's going on. Um, so DPH, the State Department of Public Health, recognized the importance of local level interventions, gave us some, fed, uh, gave us some, some funding through a block grant, um, 550,000 to date for five years, and we received another $140,000 in the past two years, excuse me, $155,000 in the past two years through state and federal funding. So we're getting a good chunk of money. Um, it seems like a lot when we're saying it overall, but the primary um, outsource of this money goes to a full-time coordinator for Hampshire Hope, which is Cherry Sullivan, which I think you've all met before she's come here and talked to you about Hampshire Hope. So partnering with the DA's office, Hampshire Hope's a county-wide opioid initiative, okay? It is a coalition made up of professionals, concerned professionals, community members, um, the public. We're all working together collaboratively to understand how the opioid or heroin crisis is affecting our community. Um, we're assessing what contributes to the rising rates of, uh, of uh, opioid use. And we're working together to find solutions and addressing, uh, and through interventions, strategic interventions, addressing the problems. Coalition work is really important. Um, it's not that this work wasn't being done prior to Hampshire Hope being born. It was being done in silos, in pockets, and people weren't connecting. Um, so what this has done is it's gotten everybody to the table. We're able to do massive brain dumps on the issue, and again, we're able to connect each other, all these sectors that have been participating in the work throughout the years. So using a strategic, a public health strategic framework model, um, we're able to identify our problem statements and then come up with data-based, data-driven, evidence-based strategies to combat, to combat these problem statements. So what has happened, if you want to go to the next slide, <coughs> is we have, um, the money comes to the Massachusetts Opioid Abuse Prevention Collaborative, the money that I was talking about for the grant. If you go to the next slide, um, we have working groups that have been put together through all of this uh, needs assessment data that we've put together. We have healthcare solutions group, treatment intervention and recovery group, outreach and communication, law enforcement, youth prevention, 
and one that was established during our um, needs assessment was the Housing and Workforce Development Working Group, but it wasn't priority in our first year, and then we learned come year two when we redid our needs assessment, is that there's already this work going on on a regional basis. So we've connected with the work groups, but it's not one of Hampshire Hope's primary working groups at this point. Question, mm -hmm. please. When you're saying that it's connected to this working group, a lot of it, if you're reading the paper, they're like from out of town and so forth that this is happening. Mm -hmm. So do we help them right here in the city or did they go to where they live, like Holyoke, Springfield, Connecticut, or wherever? Well, I mean, Northampton isn't a hub of all of the resources. I mean, um, you'll find more resources in Holyoke and Greenfield. Okay. So it really depends on geography. And just because, you know, you don't get treatment also in, in the community that you live in or perhaps even the county. Sometimes, you know, if you are at that place where you're ready for treatment, you might go to, you know, another part, maybe out to the Cape to one of their recovery centers or somewhere else. So it's not really based on geography, essentially. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about Northampton overdose fatalities or non-fatalities, we're just counting the num those numbers are the people that reside here. It's not the people who actually might have OD'd here. That number looks completely different. So when okay. you see number three per year or whatever, that's just because their residence is right here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So how is Northampton part of the solution? Well, this collaborative, and if you want to go to the next slide, Hampshire Hope. Um, we primarily work around prevention. I'll tell you, um, I, I put this, these slides together on Friday, and today, after this, uh, this weekend's incident, I changed it, and I just put this slide up here as number one. How is Northampton part of the solution? Well, I'll tell you what, it was about 9.15 on Friday night when I got a call from Northampton's emergency manager letting me know that there were six um, overdoses here in Northampton in the past few hours. So immediately, I contacted Attorney Sul uh, District Attorney Dave Sullivan. I contacted our uh, care people over at Cooley Dickinson Hospital. And then what I did was I contacted, and this all happened in minutes, just you know, via text. Gotta love it, you know? Um, I contacted my public health colleagues in Hampshire County, and I asked them to contact all their EMDs, fire, and police. So I want to say within 10 minutes, we really had the entire county covered on who should be notified about this uptick of overdoses. And um, I was also told at that point it was taking two or three Narcan administrations to revive the person. So I also wanted to let them know. And at that point, I'd also heard that Cooley Dickinson Hospital was running low on Narcan. So I actually put that alert out to my public health colleagues too. So they can ask their EMDs what they have for Narcan on hand if Cooley Dickinson needed it. But we've also, in this pre-planning stage, have kind of set up this phone tree for the hospitals. If they were to see an uptick, and there's no number on what an uptick is. It's just, if you're looking at a certain period hour and you have a certain amount of cases coming in, you'll consider that an uptick that they'll send out internal messaging through the hospitals to let them know also that this is what we're dealing with. So connectivity is huge, you know? Um, I, I think it's just one of the best things that this coalition, I mean, we're doing a lot of good work in terms of prevention, but one of the, the best things that happened out of this. And we talked about it when there was an uptick, I wanna say about a year and a half ago, but this was kind of the first time that we, we had to use this plan and it worked swimmingly, beautifully. So, it's kind of scary, though, the Cooley Dick having it at a very low level. I mean, what happened? I'm not sure, and we, kind of, we haven't had kind of like our hot wash for after the attack, the event took place, and now let's see what worked and what didn't work. I haven't connected with them yet, okay. but that's something that we'll discuss and make sure that they had a plan in place. We had contacted Tapestry, our, our friends at Tapestry Health, too, yeah. on Friday night um, to see what they had in terms of Narcan available but yeah well those are for discussions down the road could you sure. explain something to me Mary sure. please when somebody overdoses like that mm -hmm. how long does it take 
for somebody not to come out of it. What is the time involvement? You know, I can't answer that. Maybe so, they must come. Yeah, so basically what happens is it depends on how fast your body metabolizes. So you have to look at the individual. Do they have liver? Does everything metabolize through liver? So, all right, how, how fast do they metabolize drugs? Anyway, so older people, you know, metabolize much slower than, say, a younger person. So you look at that, you look at the amount that they took, the concentration. Um, so chances are what we give them is only going to last for a little while. Um, so, and also on the clinic, so there's different ways to get uh, Narcan. What the community uses and the police officers use uh, um, is a, a form of verse that you screw it together, you put it as readily available. Uh, as paramedics, we also, we can carry big vials of it. We can draw it up in syringes and things. So we, we're, we don't worry about, we're not going to run out in Northampton as far as at least the, the ambulances will always have plenty of it. So mm -hmm. I have, I carry big bottles of the stuff. I can really draw up as much as I want. So don't well, worry about that. How do you that. know how much somebody is taking and how much to give? You you start off and you start increasing the dose as needed. So one of the, the police officers and the public, the, they spray it up the nose and it absorbs through the, the the, the meconium and mucus and all that in your, in your nose. As paramedics, we'll, a lot of times we can start that process, uh, but do you give it more control? We'll start an IV and we can start injecting it into the IV at a, a, a lower rate. And <coughs> what we're looking to do with the Narcan is not necessarily wake the person up so they can get them run away like I told you the guy did as a paramedic. I'm looking to get the guy to breathe on his own. Yeah. So I don't mind him, unconscious, breathing on his own. He's not gonna give me a hard time, it's great. Right, where you know, so if he you bring him up and, he, and I want to get him to the hospital because he needs care, so that's the goal. Take this person get in the hospital. So we try to do is um, you give him a couple doses up the nose, uh, and, it, and it doesn't bring them around. We'll start an IV on them, and we can start with the IV running in, start administering a little bit of drug, and you can see the eyes will start flicking, the pupils will start to react a little bit now, and we know that we're getting the point. You just see them start breathing on their own again. So once they start breathing, you see them breathing 10 to 12 times a minute, then you can stop with an Arcan right there, transform the hospital, and then the hospital can continue with the therapy at that point. Because uh, a couple things can happen from giving too much Narcan where you could put them instantly into a withdrawal, which that's better than dying from not breathing. Or, um, you know, so we try to watch. There's a lot of, you know, things in medicine with it. So, but yeah, so we're not gonna run on Narcan, we'll have plenty. Um, there's no overdosing on Narcan. There's no, you can, I can take it right now and do a thing mm -hmm. to us, mm -hmm. nothing. Because basically, we have a receptor site and the uh, opioid sits in that receptor site. Well, the Narcan comes along and bumps that out and takes its place. But as eventually, as the Narcan gets eaten up by the receptor site, it, it goes away, then that, that heroin <coughs> still floating around the system can go right back in the receptor site again. So that's how it works, basically. Wow. It's just like, you know, you know, so it comes along, knocks out the, the opioid in the receptor site, takes its place for a while, and then as that gets eaten up. So that's why it's dangerous not to get them to the hospital. You want to get that person back to the hospital, and then they can be monitored. They may not require any more Narcan at that point, but we don't know that, you know? I think this is very educational, and I thank you for at least answering my question, because I don't know anything about it or what it does. Yeah. This will there even more. Yeah, yeah. Just want to work, uh, show you a little bit more what we're doing here. So another thing that we've been working hard on is a safe storage campaign. So a PNS screening is done at the high school's 8th, 10th, 12th grade, I believe it is. It's just a survey, asks youth questions anonymously. And one of um, the data points that came out of that PNS data is children, kids, youth, get prescriptions through their parents' um, medicine cabinet or friends or family. So we really worked hard on coming up with a safe storage campaign. We go out to a lot of community outreach events and bring lock boxes and show them and hand out this information. It's a nice little postcard actually that goes in all of the kids' backpacks and we send to home about how to store your medicine safely and how to dispose your medicine when you're done. Um, so that is an initiative we're working on. I'm used to clicking my own, sorry. Good Samaritan, like I, uh, District Attorney Sullivan had mentioned before, getting the message out there. If you see someone in trouble, to call 911. Doesn't matter the scene, unless, well, there are a few caveats to that. But for most most part, um, it doesn't matter, you won't get in trouble. Um, Chief Casper and myself actually went and talked to um, the high school students about the Good Sam law and and they didn't even know that a you could do that but they were asking about well what if a friend is drunk so
So it's this overarching umbrella that protects you. So they were very interested in about that. Um, next slide, please. <coughs> me. Narcan training availability. This is really great, and I don't. The slide really didn't do it justice, so I brought you a printout of this map. You just want to pass it down. So it's widespread, okay? The, um, the blue tells you we're only fire EMS carrying our hand. <coughs> the blue, the green with the blue stripe is fire EMS and police carrying our hand. And then the yellow squares are drug take back box at police stations. So that's where people can drop off their unused medication. And then again, all these people, fire EMS and police carrying Narcan, we have a pretty, you know, we, we've done a good job here in Massachusetts, in Hampshire County, all of, uh, this is actually the whole Northwestern District. <coughs> Another campaign. Esbert, screening brief intervention and referral for treatment. Um, Karen Jarvis Vance, who works for the school department, has done a fabulous job on this. She treats, uh, excuse me, she trains nurses on this and, um, that. So what it is, is it's an algorithm that shows you, it's a screening tool, and then it shows you where if you've scored on the screening tool, there's an algorithm on what needs to be done. So they do this, I think, for me, I mean. Beginning of school year, I think it's the ninth graders that they end up talking to. I, don't, I, I think they're going to try to get funding from way to grades. But, the ninth graders and to uh, just to ask uh, maybe five or six simple questions mm -hmm. and uh, then be able to um, maybe counsel them you know if there's uh, that situation where there is a addiction issue or potential addiction issue so Northampton was the pioneer there were one or four places in the state that started as part and it's really taken off and I'd say that uh, probably half my school districts now have gone to uh, Esbert. So it's a great intervention tool that has an action plan associated with it. Next screen, please. NRC, Northampton Recovery Center, Lynn Farrow and, and the district attorney really have championed this. Um, uh, Sherry, you know, just kind of helps just do any type of facilitation around this. Um, but it's a peer-led recovery group that allows and provides for a safe and bar environment and pathway for people who are in all stages of recovery and their families too. So it's a safe meeting place that takes place here in uh, the Edwards Church. They're actually looking for a permanent location um, and the DA has funded this and um, they're, we're actually now just talking about how to make it sustainable because obviously it's not something that they can fund out of their budget on a permanent basis. So those are some things that you can think about after we leave here today. Then another type of intervention that we talked about is, you know, with the athletes, um, they've been working on it again when they're doing the concussion sessions to integrate that 17 minute video that Dr. Ruth Cote has done around opioids and we're hoping actually bring it to the university level too. Next screen, please. Can I just ask you one question mm -hmm. quickly? Okay, when you're talking about athletes, <coughs> what do they substitute for them? What would they take? Well, you know, I'm a firm believer in good old ibuprofen. You know, it's, okay. I'm not sure it's up to the physicians and the athletic trainers, but I don't think, you know, you should be numbing people's pain so they don't feel it so they can go back out the, on the field and play, you know, the last quarter. So that's personal opinion. Um, you know, I have a personal story where my daughter, who had just turned 18, had a major surgery. And we left the, the hospital two days after the fact with a prescription. This was less than two years ago, mind you, with a prescription of 100 oxy. They never said to us it has um, addictive properties. They never asked about family history. The only thing they said to us was stay ahead of the pain. They didn't once mention there are alternatives like ibuprofen and Tylenol every two hours, you know? So, again, I mean, that's just. Yeah, there are alternatives, but again. So they all need to come together and be educated. And we are, you know, we really are. This isn't, you know, it can't happen in, in a silo. And this is why this coalition, this work is so very important. So people are talking about it, absolutely. Thank you. And then, yes, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. But 
that couldn't happen now, right after the passage of the right, No, absolutely. So it's seven days and whatever the max would be per day. I don't know if it's every. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's usually seven. 30. Is it so 30? Four, okay. Four mm -hmm. times seven. Okay. Yeah. And it, and it depends on the dose. But okay. Yeah. Thank you. And what's good is that the, the law allows, and you of course have to be a sort of, you can ask that it only be for a certain period below that. So you could say, I want three days supply, or I want two days supply, and only that amount can get filled. Now naturally, if you use that up, you'd have to go back to the prescriber. But it's a, it's a good step forward that if you don't want all those pills, you don't want them hanging around the house mm -hmm. afterwards, mm -hmm. then you can you know opt for something else. So that's, that's the, the partial fill part of it. Legislation. I guess it shows a, a change in philosophy in our state and our whole society that we don't just, here's a hundred pills of painkillers um, and just throw painkillers at um, every, all, all pain. Right. More thoughtful <coughs> kinds of effects that can come from that. So mm -hmm. that's progress. Absolutely. Absolutely. A few other interventions that we're working on safe needling, handling, and disposal. This just kind of came about um, within the last month or so. I mean, it's always been on our brain, but we really started thinking about it uh, probably about a month ago. Um, those who are picking up dirty needles on the street, we need, pro we need policy, we need protocol around it. It's not enough just to wear your, um, your latex gloves and pick it up and throw it in a sharps container. Because we actually had an officer get stuck with a dirty needle about a month ago. And we realized that there really is no set policy. They've done some brief training, um, but we, sh we should talk about setting policy through each municipality about safe needle handling. Um, and we're also working, as part of this, we're gonna work with the restaurants here in town because we've surveyed the restaurants during one of our last um, uh, permit renewal processes. Um, they have a lot of times they'll find loose syringes in their bathrooms. They've seen them up in the drop ceilings. They've seen them in the trash can. Um, so they're really working around this as a municipality, but we're going to push it through, you know, the coalition to make sure that you know it's far reaching through the, the county too. Dart. Um, I think Jody's going to come and talk about Dart in a little bit. We're working, we got a $15,000 grant to work on sheltering in an emergency situation, people with substance use disorder. There's a monthly article that comes out through Hampshire Hope and the Gazette and the Recorder. And then we have monthly meetings with our um, executive committee. We have quarterly meetings with a larger body. And then we have all sorts of trainings that we're putting on on a regular basis. There's two coming up that are pretty noteworthy. One is uh, the 15th of May going to be at the Edwards Church Community uh, Community Center. And then we have our Hampshire, Ho Hampshire Hope Open House on June 15th, where we're opening up to the public, um, everyone in Hampshire County and further, whoever wants to come. It's going to be up at Union Station. And Michael Botticelli is going to be our um, keynote speaker. And at that point, it's our intent to build a hope and recovery wall where people can come in and bring pictures and stories of their loved ones will be either either past or in recovery and we're gonna put them together like a puzzle and and just put a big wall and hopefully put it on some type of um, cloth and and have a permanent type of hanging so on june 15th yeah at union station yeah and who's the speaker michael Bevicelli. he was the drug czar for the obama administration what time is that it's going to start at 5 o'clock. The keynote is going to start at 6. <coughs> and what's the cost? Three. It is mm -hmm. at the Union Station. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dinner is not going to be served. There'll be like refreshments there. <laughs> but And could I also ask you about the dinner at the Everett <coughs> Church? Lynn, do you have information on that dinner? Uh, I do. Um, it's uh, modeled on what the community dinner that's happened in Ware the last several years. And so um, it's uh, Susan Grant Rosen, who's a minister, um, wanted to get all the uh, congregations kind of involved and, and educated. And with Hampshire Hope, um, they're providing this for the community. And after dinner, there will be a panel discussion. Some people in recovery will be on that panel. 
Um, I think two of the men who come to the recovery center who are actually in the Hampshire House of Corrections will be on that panel, um, as well as Ed Schreiber, uh, who is um, director of um, addiction services at ServiceNet and is also in recovery, will be on that panel. Um, and I'm not sure who, who all else is going to be there, but it's just a very informal, and it, it's free. Um, you just to, walk in? You just walk in. Well, it's it would be good if you could RSVP. And I have to have a flyer. I'll give, you, I'll give you a flyer, <laughs> and then you'll see. OK. okay. So I mean, those are just some of the highlights that I, I showed you in terms of um, prevention. But um, a lot of work is going on, considering we've only been an up and running coalition for <coughs> two years. So next slide. Um, here is, this was provided by Lynn actually. This is the first quarter data for 2017 to compare what it looks to the first quarter of 2016. So hopefully, the way I see it, our prevention efforts are really making a difference this year. Let's just keep our fingers crossed. Well, that was my line before yeah, <laughs> Friday's event, but who knows. Um, and next slide. And that's the breakdown by town for the first quarter of 2017. So Northampton had one overdose, three in the county. Can I ask a question about that? Before you made a distinction between these are there by the residents, not where the ODD happened. Right. Mm -hmm. um, are, are, are we seeing folks from, from elsewhere ODing in Northampton because of availability here? It's rare. It's very rare. Oh, the fatalities are rare anyway. You know, that is, um, no, we don't mm -hmm. track anything like that. Can I speak to that, please? Hi, Nancy. I have a store here, Happy Valley on Main Street, and it's next to Faces, and the bench is in front of our store. So I've gotten to know some of these folks, and I see them on a daily basis in all sorts of conditions. Um, recently, we have all, all of us on the street have seen an uptick in the number of people coming from out of town. They may not be showing up in your fatality statistics, but they're there. We've all noticed it, and they're tougher than the usual, typical Northampton dealers and users that we've been seeing all along. They're tougher, and they many of them have been incarcerated, and they're in and out of the system, and all that kind of stuff. And they're re even more recently than that, in the last week or so, there's a second group of yet tougher characters who have, who have shown up on the streets that we haven't seen before. These people, when I've heard them, they have come from Greenfield, Holyoke, Westfield, Chicopee, and Agawam. And that's just what I've overheard them say as they pass by handing off their eyes. Oh, sure, there's no doubt. Yeah, they're coming but they're coming. We, are, we used to get shoppers. Mm -hmm. it. Now mm -hmm. we, are, we seem to be attracting more of these users from all these other surrounding towns than we used to. Mm -hmm. So that's one trend that, yeah. uh, you know, it may not be showing up in your sure. statistics mm -hmm. yet, but we've all noticed it. Mm -hmm. And they are a tougher bunch, mm -hmm. too. These are more hardcore folks than we've had on the streets before. I'm not sure, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if an organization, either um, the hospitals or EMS, I'm not sure how it's coded internally, if we can even pull that data. But it's something to think about, you know. Um, but yeah, the data that we're getting right now yeah. is just based off of residency. Mm -hmm. there, there are more than, well, I'm just staying, just because I can't stay all that long, I closed to be here. Yeah, I was mentioning to her, you know, it might be helpful for those of us who are on Main Street and whose customers and shoppers and strollers come by all the time to have some of this information to give to people. I'm not talking so much about the drug stuff. We all have the handout to say where you can get free food, but that's not the problem for these folks. I offer them food all the time, and, and there's free food in town every day but Friday, and many of them are loaded up on the food. But the information about the recovery center and about these who you can talk to, or I run into families, women usually all the time, who've lost somebody mm -hmm. to this to disease, to the fent fentanyl now, it's being more and more fentanyl, who've lost their sons, you know, or their sweethearts to these drugs. And they need to know where to get some support <coughs> too and all that kind of stuff. And if we had handouts in the stores that we could give to these, we get into these conversations all the time. That is on our work you know, plan for the just upcoming Just these year. simple mm -hmm. things to give to them about all the facilities and the programs. 
not for the users so much. They know about that. We have those for them. Mm -hmm. But for everybody else who's affected by it mm -hmm. and how to help it. Don't, I always tell them, so I'm not going to ever give you money. Give you food, envelopes, anything you want. Not money. If there's some way to encourage people not to give the money, because we know where that's going to. Anyway, so handouts, something that we can do to, that would be helpful and informative would be great. Thank you. So in closing, yeah. Yeah, yeah great. There's a whole main street for people who want to support this thing. And if you can figure out how to use us and what we can do to help, Absolutely. we reach a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. No, nope, just wanted to give you, you know, our Hampshire Hope website. And if you have any questions, to contact Cherry or myself about the prevention work that's going on. Great. Thanks, thank you. Are there any other questions from counselors? No. Or from anyone in the public? Hi there, Craig Stevens. Uh, I own a business in town, Landscapes, and um, so a friend of mine's here and suggested that I might come. Um, my company um, <clears throat> hires people in recovery, like 100%, and uh, I've been here for about 16 years, and I've been clean and sober for 17. And um, you know, I, j I guess I just want to say it's great to have everybody in on this because this is not a police thing doing it the police way and it's not the health thing doing it the health care way it's everybody's problem <clears throat> excuse me I have a, a, a little bit of laryngitis but um, on the 18th of May my company is sponsoring a movie at the Academy called um, Generation Found and it's free admission for everybody and it's exactly what you're talking about about across the board everybody being involved with this um, epidemic <clears throat> and so what I've done with my own um, company, it's been, you know, there's been hundreds of people that have gone through, um, and I had no, you know, manual. <laughs> I just winged it and came up with a bunch of stuff to make it, make it all work. And, uh, you know, I just want to say that it doesn't matter where the drugs are coming from. As long as people want them, they're going to get them, you know, no, no matter what they are, not even the cost, you know. And, um, I, I've had to really use a lot of tough love with these guys. Um, I personally don't allow methadone and um, Suboxone. It's a great harm reduction technique, but um, you know, I want to put a, a, a call out to all of you that NA and AA is a great resource that has been here for a long time and is very established. And I think <clears throat> some people overlook that because it's just been around for a while. And uh, all these other projects I'm familiar with, the new recovery project, I was there with a few people on some of the beginning meetings. And, um, you know, there's just, all of this stuff means something. And uh, I think, you know, I've found that, like a lot of the guys end up when you have, working is a, a big piece of every single one of our lives. And it's great to get recovery and it's great to get help. But if you never start working, I swear that I've seen it. They mm -hmm. just, you know, they just slide back into it. And, um, you know, I'm really excited because I've sort of had this, <clears throat> things happen over the winter where people that used to work for me have come out and let me know, you know, the change that it's made in their life. So um, I, I really am doing this for a public service, a community service, the film. Don't anyone call me for work. We have way too much work to do. <laughs> it's not about trying to get more work, but um, it's a great community event. And uh, the ripple effect of recovery, you know, the ripple effect from this disease is staggering. But the ripple effect of recovery has been extraordinary in my life. So I just want to like, say that out loud. <laughs> I, I want to say thank you. Um, I think it's really um, the lifeline of hope uh, by giving people a job. And yeah. what you're doing and you're working with people who are getting a second chance, you're giving it to them and you're giving them that hope and that optimism uh, to move forward. And like you say, you know, if you don't have a purpose in life, yeah. a job or a volunteer, it, it, you really can get lost and in, in, in out there. And I, and I did look at the trailer from your film, and it looks great. Really. <laughs> Good. It looks super. And if I can just, just what add. Time? Oh, it's May, May 18th at 7 p.m. 
free admission, doors open at 6.30. Thursday night. Directly competing with a council meeting, yeah. unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> 7 o'clock on a city council night. Yeah. City. It might that. be a quick meeting. Better change that. Change, that. change that meeting. Yeah. If I could just, 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 just follow up. Uh, I, I've, I've known Craig for much of that 16 years that he's been operating this business. And I can, I, I've seen a lot of a lot of your guys and a few women too, I think, come, in, yep. come, come, come through your your system and it is quite remarkable how, how many how many folks have you employed through that period of time, uh i think it's around 140 wow. at this point you know and by the way it's not only a second chance it's sometimes a third yeah, or a fourth. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I get you so, but but it, it, it's an enormous impact i thank you too yeah. for what you've done oh you're welcome what a wonderful model i mean yeah yes. yeah, you'd be willing to maybe sit when we have this working group i'm running locally you know and just sure Put that story out there and maybe it'll catch on, you know, maybe that'll have a ripple effect. Yeah. But what a great model I commend you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Craig. Sure. Yeah, I, I'd like, I want to thank you also. Everybody's wants to thank you. <laughs> and, and also echo that because one of the things that I'm real clear about and that I see all the time, uh, because we see, as I say, all sorts of stages. We see them nodded out, we see them being aggressive, we see them being depressed and quiet, we see everything on the street. Is that it's real clear to me that the people on the street may not have an identity out there in the sober world, but they have an identity on the street. Mm -hmm. They're the king or the queen of the milk crates. They're the, the mama figure. They're the daddy figure. They're the clown figure. They're, they have a role. They have an identity. And if you just put them into rehab for a few days and a week or two or three weeks, and you take them out and you put them back in the same way, they have no identity. One of the things you're giving them is some standing and some stature that they had when they were using and you're transferring that over into work and responsibility and giving them something to be proud of themselves about and kind of help rebuild an identity. And if without that piece, people are not usually gonna get sober and stay sober. Because they're just gonna, and, and what happens is, because I've seen this too, they, they go, they get into rehab, they come on the street, the first person to come over and talk to them is the dealer. Because those dealers want them back. The minute they come on the street, the big octopus reaches over and gets them, and they have nothing else in its place. So whatever social services or employers or all can do to help these folks gain some standing and some identity and some other way to be proud of themselves for doing something positive, the better you can help people rebuild their lives. I don't know what the answer is. Maybe the city could hire them to help us take care of the place or something. I don't know. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any other questions or comments from counselors or on, on yes. the whole subject or are we, on the are whole we, subject? I okay. This one. I know if we're waiting for other presentations or. I what? well, the police. I, and I don't know why yeah. the police didn't make it, but. Well, I wanted to just raise one issue that I thought was interesting, which is I saw on Saturday the Massachusetts Medical Association. Uh, voted to take an interesting position on a controversial issue. And they endorsed a pilot program of two um, medically supervised drug use clinics. And that's obviously a very controversial proposal. I'm not even sure I know my position on it yet, but I think it shows that, I mean, it shows how serious things are when that proposal is made as a way to make sure that people stay safe uh, while, while dealing with their addiction uh, and not asking anyone to take a position on that necessarily now. I mean, I wonder uh, what reaction is there in the community of, of people who do this every day to, to that proposal? I think it's worth uh, doing a pilot program. I think it's worth, you know, seeing how it goes. And, you know, certainly uh, there are users that are going to use and you know, to have a safe environment is, is something to look at. So uh, I know that I read the same article that uh, it was shown in certain communities to reduce the number of overdose fatalities by 30% plus. So, you know, to reduce those fatalities is obviously something that we want because, you know, without, you know, reducing them, you never have a chance to put people in recovery if they pass away. So I think it's worth uh, Massachusetts, maybe two, three, four. Uh, places in Massachusetts that have high incidence rates to uh, be able to experiment. So that, that's my perspective on it, is that it's worth exploring alternatives. Can I 
think the indirect effect also needs to be looked at a little more closely. Like how taxing is just six overdose calls here in Northampton on our police and fire and EMS because they both go out to the call when it comes in. So just take it on a larger scale in a larger community how that could actually relieve or give some relief to first responders and the community and the hospitals on a whole too. So I definitely think it's worth looking into. Thank you. If, if I just make what would be my final statement on, on the subject is I really appreciate hearing that openness to those ideas, to hear the openness to that idea and others from our district attorney, you hear the many different things that um, Hampshire Hope is doing. Um, and the, the reason I'm, I'm proud of that is because this subject that we um, convened this committee meeting today to discuss is one of these subjects that, frankly, politicians, great and small, pay a lot of lip service to. You know, for example, the president <coughs> talked about this incessantly uh, in his campaigns. He would go up to New Hampshire and talk about this in particular. And then the budget he proposed, he proposed cutting $100 million from um, uh, substance abuse recovery. So I feel like here in Hampshire County and Western Mass, I think there's people are willing to experiment and actually do things. And I'm, I'm very grateful that you took the time that you, that you do this and also they took the time to come and educate the city council. Well, I have no doubt all of us want to be as supportive as possible uh, of, of all the things you want to do. Council? If I might just, just add, add my own appreciation. It, it, it is really very, very instructive and helpful to understand. It's one thing to understand a, a state legislation and, and resources made, made available, but to understand and see the impact Five hundred fifty thousand dollars over 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 four or five years, and at the at the at the street level, uh, the case by case level is what what that all translates into, and the and the series of really concrete down to earth steps that they're taking. It's very it's very uh, it's, it's 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 really good to see uh, policy at the state level and commitment at the local level uh, produce this uh, this uh, this series of integrated programs. And then and then my my question is. Uh, of course, theoretically, part of what our committee at the council does is to ask, how can we be of help? <laughs> and I'm not, but so I'll, I'll, I'll throw it out there. How, what, what more can the city of Northampton be, 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 <coughs> be doing? Um, uh, and, and, is, and is there any way our committee or any of us as, as, as counselors can, can, can add momentum to the effort already underway? Just throw that out there. Well, from my perspective, you get a, a wonderful uh, health department, and, uh, and fire department, police department to keep supporting all these first responders. And the fact that City of Northampton took the lead on the grant for Hampshire Hope has made all the difference in the world. It's, it's, what it's done is it's got 100 people rowing the boat in the same, a single boat in the same direction versus being scattered. So I think uh, you know, you've got wonderful department heads here, and I think uh, the support that you give them through the budget and also to the work you do individually is really important. But what happens when the grant comes in? Right, that was in my pitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, we apply for another grant, yeah. Hopefully, uh, yeah. Hopefully there will be more funding out there that we can reapply for, but having the support and the understanding of the work that's being done is huge, and um, just passing the word along and, and staying mm -hmm. in tune. Mm -hmm. Being done at the I'm going to make a pitch for a permanent space for the Northampton Recovery Center free of charge until we can get funded. Maybe like a crazy request, but if you're all thinking about it, maybe something will show up. So. Yeah. Can, can I just yeah. add one thing too? Is um, you know when the. It, Na is it Nancy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she. Nancy was bringing up about this um, people on the street and whatnot. One thing I, I do, I've always noticed just because I'm sober, <laughs> is there's not a whole lot of sober things to do. I've had to, I've actually made sober dances and parties just because I didn't want to go to, you know, what, what was the high school pop dance again, because that's the only sober dance there was. So I made some really wild sober dances and, uh, and it was a lot of fun. And then the, uh, is it the DYI, the new downtown is it D D DNA. 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 That's it. The DNA had that, you know, the so the, the fall stroll, and they're going to do a summer one, mm -hmm. and then Arts Night Out. That's a little bit wine and cheesy, but um, you know, like there's just some more sober activities because 
everything has got booze on it. Everything. And so whenever stuff comes up to you, city councils that you know you can put your okay on, you know that doesn't have to have booze in it all the time, or a half and half or something, you know, that it really is important because everything is everything fun is supposed to have booze with it, you know. So anyway, that's my pitch. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. And do you guys have anything more to add? No, I. I I provide some packets, and uh, we've got a great resource guide that Lynn and other people put together for distributing uh, around the community, and a lot of the similar information that, that, that Meredith gave. And you know, I just think that um, it, it's all of us that it could be part of the, the solution, even a small bit. And uh, whether it's an employer giving people a second, third, or fourth chance, or uh, other people that uh, really take an interest in recovery. And, it's really important, so um, you know, I, I thank you for, for having me and for having this discussion. Thank you, yes, Coach. Yes. Maybe, Dave, if what you heard, you could let Lori know to invite him at our next advisory committee meeting and let him talk about what he's doing. Okay, great. So, if you could give all your information sure. to Lynn and we'll be in touch. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. It's really nice to meet you. Yeah. Thanks for doing that. Yeah, stop by. Um, if you wanted that, or in 20 minutes, yeah. You know, we yeah. have a little yeah. gathering. Oh, oh, I know all about it. Oh, you do? Oh, you're little, you mean the one up front? No. Oh, oh you mean? Yeah. In the back of the shop. We made a space so we have for the community. If you something you ever want to talk about, like oh, 30 okay. people right, or so. Cool. We made it oh, so we just right. Thank, Thank you for speaking up. Yeah, yeah. Really. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you. 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 Th
Yeah. My neighbor's daughter was across the street. I've been in I hope and I were at Bill Sullivan's and he was there real nice. Right. Uh, like, uh, uh, here is provided. I'm just going to uh, uh, let folks know we're starting up our meeting again. Okay, go ahead. Oh, okay. 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 I wasn't sure if you were going more or you were done. So. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. We have oh, we've 13 <laughs> appointments to deal with. So. Oh, I thought you were done. Go for it. <laughs> You're not sticking around? Oh, you are. Okay, we are reconvening okay. now at 522 and having heard a presentation from various departments about the opioid crisis in Northampton, we'll move on now with uh, the approval of minutes for April 10th. No, to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No abstentions? That carries. And then we have, as I said, 13 appointments. And um, I guess what Councilor Labarge just suggested was we might take these up uh, just with comments one at a time and maybe as a group, if it seems as though they're all sent with a positive recommendation, take them as a group, uh, excluding the last two, which were new appointments, and then we can take them as a group. Is that? Yes. Sounds good. good. Okay. So I know we had um, three reappointments to the planning board. And anything to comment on those, uh, Councilor Dunn? No, uh, my reappointments, I was not able to uh, connect with these people. Um, so I'm gonna take them, I'm gonna take the recommendation from the mayor uh, and rely on their record uh, doing the job since their reappointments, you know, as, as sufficient. Um, betting, if you will, for the position. Um, although, particularly, Ann Brooks, someone I know from the Transportation Parking Commission, and um, can certainly speak affirmatively in favor of her. But these are reappointments, and I think that um, uh, we should we should move a re positive recommendation for the reappointments. In play. Okay. So just to note for the record, that was yeah. Ann Brooks and Mark Sullivan and John Lutz, each for reappointment to the Planning Board. And then, my list here somewhere, <laughs> Councilor Goodwell actually had a couple of folks for the Central Business Office. Yes, and I spoke both with Robert Walker and Aylin Tierney, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her first name right, but um, she, she actually, they're both reappointments. She, as chair, uh, she is particularly uh, enthusiastic about the current makeup of the committee. Uh, these are two excellent folks, uh, so we should uh, we should support them uh, for a reappointment. Okay, thank you. Any comments, uh, Council Labarge, on John Cousins? Yeah, I had a, a nice conversation with um, John Kaczynski. Um John has been on the board for a three-year term, and um, he's reapplying for another three years. And like he told me again, which is on his application, he's a retired school teacher. He applied to be on the COA board and just loves the way the board interacts on the direction they are going in. He sees a lot of seniors, interacts with them, and hears what they have to say and what they would like to see happen at the senior center. 
he really enjoys watching the seniors socialize. That's so important to him. He feels that there's a great schedule of activities that are presented to the seniors. And he said the rooms are usually filled with programs going on. Um, John had suggested to the previous director, Pat Shaughnessy, since the back room was not going to be used for the rec department, use it as an exercising room. And he was so happy that this has happened. Um, he was very vocal about transportation and the need of it. And he also participated in the Kick the Tires campaign and, and worked along with the previous director. And they raised 60 something thousand on that. John and his wife, Barbara, and you'll see them at the dinners that they have. They do all the holiday dinners, all the food preparations, and of the cooking of many, many volunteers. And he enjoys being on the board and working together with them and meeting and talking. He is on the food committee, and they are looking at the bistro now and how they can work with Smith Oak or the county jail and culinary to get this back in service and make some money in the use of the room. He is hoping to be reappointed back on the COA board and thanks the city council for his reappointment again. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, for the trust fund, Councilor Bigwell spoke with Stockton Williams. Uh, I did, this is a, a reappointment as well. Uh, he, by way of financial and other backgrounds, is very well qualified. He's looking forward to being reappointed. Okay. And Councilor Barge has two others now, the Board of Registrars, Sandra yeah. Hallowell. I had a lengthy talk with Sandra. Um, she was great. And she really enjoys being on the Board of Registrars. She has been on it since 1995 or so. She feels this is a great way to get back to her city. She really enjoys it. She stated when Wendy Mosna became the city clerk, Everything became streamlined and organized. She really loves being on the board and hopes to be reappointed. Sandra wants to thank the city council for hopefully reconsidering her again. Thank you. You're welcome. And then you also spoke with Ruth McGrath for the Disability Commission. Yep. Um, Ruth McGrath, um, there are many reasons why she would like to be reinstated on the Disability Commission. Um, she is saying these are probably the top five. Um, she has experience and skills to contribute. She's been a member of the Disability Commission in Washington, D.C. and Enfield, Connecticut before joining the Northampton Disability Commission. She started as a volunteer for the Northampton Disability Commission nine years ago, taking minutes. I was there when she started. When available, she became an associate member, then a regular member. Through the entire nine years, she has performed as secretary. She wants to make a difference. She believes that the right members to this commission can make a difference in people's lives, not just disabled people, but families of disabled and others. She has been blind, deaf, and spent years in a wheelchair, and she has a perspective on disabilities that few other people have. It matters, sitting home and complaining gets nothing done. She believes in working to her goals and the Disability Commission provides her a platform to work with. As a team, she believes we can educate and make a difference. Thank you, Councilor. Okay, so uh, for a reappointment to the Conservation Commission, I spoke, well, I put in a call to Tim Parshall. I did not reach him but have noted on his application, he's been a member since 2011 and uh, has a professional background as an ecologist, teaches at Westfield State, uh, is a professor there, and has a long-standing interest and in experience in environmental education. I think a very good fit um, to stay on the Conservation Commission. Uh, I spoke with Tara Booster, who is nominated for a new appointment to the Redevelopment Authority. And <clears throat> Tara is a uh, Northampton native um, 
as she says, having been a towny, smithy, and small business owner, her business was the Jackson Connor uh, high-end men's store there in uh, Thorns. Mm -hmm. And she now works for Greenfield, I think it's Greenfield Savings Bank, is that right? And um, she's looking forward to uh, bringing her perspective as a young person and someone from the community and business person to the uh, Redevelopment Authority. I thanked her for her willingness to serve and said that I would recommend her um, appointment to the Re Redevelopment Authority. So what we could do if take, take these 11 as a group, if someone wants to offer. I'd be glad to make I'll make that we motion. We pass all 11 on the positive recommendation. Okay, moved and seconded to send this group with a positive recommendation to the full council all in favor? Aye. Aye. No opposed or abstentions, that carries. And there were two more appointments that we got at the last council meeting, <coughs> Councilor LaBarge, <clears throat> agreed to speak with uh, Lorraine Weiner. Mm -hmm. I spoke with Lorraine on Saturday. Um, her and I had a lengthy talk at her home. Um, it was a great interview. I think a lot of people know Lorraine. Um, she stated to me that she has given up herself to be on this board by losing three and a half hours of pay for being on the board, and she works at the University of Mass. She leaves at 1 o'clock p.m. to be at the meeting for 1.30. She likes being on the board because of being a team player to make things better. Lorraine is a listener and does a lot of things that are suggested. Transparency, volunteering at the Senior Center. She does help doing kitchen help. She's a church leader. Swaps her days off at work to volunteer at the health fair, which is this Thursday volunteers for the Christmas holiday, the decorations, and the dinner. She is satisfied on how the director and the board work together on issues and how the director follows up on them and brings back the information to them. She would like to see the Senior Center have the bistro reopen, but to have minimum price for lunch and have a solid base of volunteers. Without the solid base of volunteers, it will not be operable. The gift shop, hopefully, changes will be made, and the committee has been assigned to check out other senior centers and how they operate and attract business. Lorraine is very happy about the PBTA van and the new one being delivered to the senior center. Transportation is so vital for seniors in the city. She is very delighted to be reappointed back on the board. Thank you. You're welcome. And the final appointment was uh, Mary Laskowski to the Council on Aging. Yes, I did speak with Mary, and um, <clears throat> she's uh, uh, excited to continue serving on the board. She really enjoys working with seniors. Has been a lifelong resident in the city of Northampton from uh, where, where she's on Bradford Street. Yes, so formerly Ward One and now Ward Three. Right. Um, but uh, I did uh, thank her for her service and for her willingness to stay on the Council on Aging and told her I'd be uh, recommending a positive recommendation for her point. I'll make that motion. Oh, would you make it for the two and we'll take yes, it? Yes, I want to make a motion for the two of them to um, recommend to full city council of approval. Thank you. And that's a second. Okay, all in favor of the two council on aging appointments say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. No abstentions. Then that carries. That takes care of our appointments. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we, um, the last item on our agenda is just our discussion about future meetings. Um, and Pam, thank you for the chart that shows which. Uh, Departments have made presentations in the last year. That's very helpful. Um, did we talk about emergency management as a possible for June, or is that that would be a good one? Is that I see that that's that's at the bottom of the list with yeah, a. I wasn't sure. There isn't a department that's emergency. No, it's really for their part of fire rescue, yeah. really. All right. Um, but I mean, we heard and we heard a. Uh, 
Well, we heard a very specific report from Fire Rescue right. today about the opioid um, right. epidemic, and the last time we saw them was a year ago. How about in May 2016? How about parks and recreation? So we did see into... parks. We did see parks in February. When and they moved into that new trailer and organized already, or what? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I don't know that we want to see them again since we no, just saw them early. I mean, if anything, it would be, I would think, police or fire, since we haven't seen... That sounds good. We haven't seen police or fire since police March of last year, and, and fire it was uh, a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, any other suggestions I, I or think comments? police would be good. Well, we have to put out requests for their availability as yeah. well. We're talking a first meeting in June. We, right now, we don't have any appointments, uh, at least for this upcoming meeting. I didn't see yeah. any new appointments on there. We have a couple that are coming. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so we'll have a few of those to deal with it, at any rate in June. I did think that um, we, we talked about this a little bit last time, but after we go through this year's budget hearings, mm -hmm. we may, that's in and of itself sort of an interview of different departments, mm -hmm. and we may have a better idea of what want to hear about in more depth in this committee after the budget is over. So good. perhaps we could defer the decision or even not meet in July given. Um, or wait until July. Or rather wait until July. I, I would but like to the first, we should note that the meeting in July might fall around, is it around the 4th of July? I think we might have rescheduled it to a different date. I'll look okay. Look, but yeah. I'll, I'll look. But one of the, the things that the mayor said at the last meeting that I thought maybe you guys might want to want to think about is he had mentioned that he's trying to get all of the expiration dates for appointments to be a June I 30th, right. um, that, you know, sort of um, end date for all appointments. Yes. So that would mean that we might have 150 people to deal with. Uh, <laughs> so there are like two years. I know. I'm not sure that you heard that, but I, I do I recall that. that. I remember thinking there's there is a certain argument for that on the other I end. I think so too. If we're going to do anything meaningful in terms of talking to folks, I, I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. maybe maybe you're going to want to think about you know how how is that going to be managed because the appointments by and large are every three years. And then, mm -hmm. bingo. Uh, so you take all the appointments throughout the whole city, divide that by three, and that's how many people you will be interviewing every June 30th or thereabout. And also, if somebody should not fulfill that position, then they have to fill it. Mm -hmm. That happens too. Well, th thank you for that reminder. For, for, <laughs> for, for, for perhaps we could, by the way of our, well, I, my, my own, I don't know how others feel, would, would be to relay back to the mayor that we've thought about it and though it has a certain symmetry to it I suppose uh, keeping them staggered actually allows us to mm -hmm. allow some time for consideration uh, and, it wouldn't, and it wouldn't otherwise be the case well I, I should I should then just alert you to the fact that all of them that you have been approving up to mm -hmm. today have now have a June 30th so it's already been done in terms it's, of it's, the mayor has already yeah. I mean, for those established that have come up for the last uh, year and a half. Yeah. Right. Well. Yeah. <clears throat> so we can just we can just determine how we want to address. Um, I mean, we could say that reappointments uh, that you know we would prioritize new appointments in terms of contacts. Um, well, I we do, would I review just throw applications that out there because. You know, it might be something you want to discuss in the future, but just give you, you know, right? To. Something for it's not going to happen until June of 2018. I, I probably right, right. So it's, it's not something we need okay. to. But um, that's another thing. Going in council, no, no. all of these appointments every three years, or some two or. Yeah, I don't think they're all three-year terms. Because no. the senior center is three. Okay. Tell me if most of these are 23. Statute. Most of the ones that we're looking at are three-year terms. I think the planning board right. might be different. Yeah, three. planning board. Like, four, 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 four
planning board, the three that we're looking at are three year terms. Yeah. The license commission, I think, is six. Six? I think so. Mm -hmm. But everything on the list that we're looking at here were three year mm -hmm. terms. Right. And on the license commission, one has to be a Republican, one has to be a Democrat. Hmm. Well, and those are by statute. Drinking so, is bipartisan. Oh, that one. Right. So, oh, yes. Sorry. Go ahead. What, what's on our agenda for June again? We just talked about foregoing, possibly foregoing June to uh, to find out if there were some issues that might come up in the budget. No, that's right. I guess I misheard. I thought we had scheduled someone. We have no one scheduled there's, at this point. No one scheduled. Oh, good. We do have great, appointments. Great. Great. But we have appointments, so we may need to meet. Got so. it. Got it. Um, so what's the? Uh, well, I was, I was just going to say, just as a way of advance notice, I'm very likely to not be able to make the June meeting. Okay. Just, just so you know. Okay. The counselor said he may not make the June meeting. That's okay. That's okay. You can go away. Okay. The daughter's wedding. Oh, oh. Well, there's the excuse. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, <clears throat> so at this point, we could, uh, has, has been offered. Well, first of all, the June, the July meeting occurs on July 3rd. Which is not a good time for. A, uh, well, do you, do you I don't see the I don't see the reschedule on my calendar, but you think we? we it did? could be July third because it's not a holiday. July first. Uh, well, July we have to 3rd. decide if we want to meet on July third. July third is the holiday. Because fourth is the holiday, right? And what you the said is the Monday. Right, but many people take that whole yeah, four sure days. Do. So I was wondering whether you think that that. July 3rd, which falls smack in the middle of the 4th of July mm -hmm. holiday, Go the next might be a good one to reschedule. I think it would be a good one. I one. think so. Would you like to look at the following week? 10th. July 10th. July 10th, well, there is also a, uh, I'm looking right now. Legislative matters. matters will be at five. We should be okay. Um, as long as there's no presentations. Oh. That would be fun. Right, and we don't know. We're, we're kind of playing that one by ear. Um, we could always try to meet up at the hearing room, too. Right? Although I'm on legislative matters. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, we could plan for an hour meeting. Aim for four and aim for an hour meeting and be. be uh, about our business. Good. I support that. Okay, so um, let's let's do that. Let's go ahead and change the July meeting to July 10th. Four o'clock. Yep. And then um, right now we can forego the June meeting. No, no, I'm sorry. We still will need to meet in June. Yeah. We still will need because we have appointments. So, uh, Councilor Bidwell may not be there, but let's plan on meeting on June 5th. Not unless he wants us to change it for him. No? No. We still have a quorum if the others of you expect to be there. So. so, we could meet on June 5th. Okay. We I take have June, uh, June 1st. No, it's June 5th. Monday. June 1st, June 1st, is, June city 1st is a Thursday. June, June 1st is City Council. Do you see that, Pam? June 1st is a Thursday? Are you in the right year? Mm -hmm. I am in the right year, but I'm looking at the... the June 5th, yes. yes. Okay. I see it now. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> we'll plan on convening on June 5th to deal with appointments that come, unless there is something that we uh, that comes up in the budget discussions in the next month sure. that we any counselor feels they'd like to maybe reach out. We could work through the administrative assistant and mm -hmm. the mayor's office <clears throat> and ask if there is chance they could meet with us on June 5th. 
Moved to adjourn. Second. And seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.